apparently. <laughs> It wore him out. So, all right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we are so glad to have you here. Let me get myself going here. Now that I hear. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. Chris, you go ahead and first slide so we get through all this stuff here. Northland Assembly is a group of people in the Northland gathered together for the common purpose to engage our community, our region, our state, and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our entire mission and our entire uh, purpose for being here. You can see our core values are written on our walls now. Uh, they're not going to stay that way. We're working on picking out a paint color to paint the walls and everything and really bring a whole new fresh life to the building. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, number one, Chris, you go ahead and hit the first slide. Hit it, hit it. So engage. Remember, we have our engage binders up here. This is not where they're going to stay. The one with a white cover is our sign-up sheets for our different types of engaged ministries, all the way from jail ministry to inner city ministry to our community uh, outreaches that we do, the food trucks that we brought in, all those things, the uh, Thanksgiving dinner. If you would love to sign up for one of those, because that's part of our thing, is to engage our community, that is where you would do it. Uh, also, part of that engage is on the back wall back there underneath uh, our Zoom monitor with uh, Brother Michael back there, where Michael's sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a small thing of business cards there, and those are these Operation Be a Blessing business cards that go with the Engage community outreach. These, you grab a, grab a couple of them, stick them in your pocket. You're out at the diner, the gas station, you're at Starbucks, if there was one, here, <laughs> somewhere, wherever you're at. <coughs> caribou. caribou, if you like caribou. I'm sorry, I actually, I don't like their politics, but I love Starbucks coffee. I can't stand their politics, but their coffee is good. I wish I could reconcile that. Darn you Tim Hortons for leaving this area. <laughs> <laughs> but then I could have been good. <laughs> then I could have had my Tim Hortons and it would have satisfied my Starbucks. So with these Operation Be a Blessing cards, if you see somebody and you're like, you know what, you feel led to, uh, you, you see an older gentleman with a veteran's hat <coughs> drinking coffee in the diner. And you feel that you know what, I want to bless this guy today. You go up, you pay for their meal, you give them the card. Like that. And so the card says, Operation Be a Blessing, a Northland Ministry Network Outreach, Badger, Rose O'Carroll, Stag Greenbush. By this, all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another, John 13, 35, which ironically is part of today's message. For prayer information, contact 218-528-4555. And on the back it says, we regularly pray for God to direct us to someone we can be a blessing to. Today, it was you. So uh, there's these cards back there. Make sure you take a couple. Use it. You're in holiday and you see somebody, you're, you're in Super One, you, you see a, a mom struggling, you see somebody maybe counting their change to buy some groceries. Hey, you know what? And you have the ability to bless them. Pray about that and do it, okay? That's, I know my wife and my mom carry some in their apron at work and they'll, they'll buy coffee, they'll pay for meals and stuff like that. It's just, it's what they do. So pray about that and think about it. Also tonight, uh, what's the next slide? The what? Okay, we'll get, we'll get that one done. So also tonight is our Roso outreach at the Roso Diner. We normally start gathering around 6, start the Bible study at 6.30. It's normally a discussion recap of today's message and some of what we've done Wednesday. So it's kind of like a recap and get people engaged and allow for some more back and forth. And we go a little bit deeper than sometimes we can normally go on a Sunday morning. So if you're free to come out, come on out. We normally have, we at least have coffee available. Uh, if somebody decides to bring cookies, then we have cookies. But uh, come on out, join us. It is a great, great time we've had. We normally have at least a couple of people from the Roseau community who don't come to church here show up so they can ask questions and they can uh, be engaged. We've had, had, we have had some of the folks from Strong 
show up. The, the workers there who stay at the hotel have showed up for it. So it's just a great time. We want we ask you guys to show up because we want that DNA replicated there. And we want those people there to know that, hey, if, if they see something going on, people are more apt to come in and check it out. But one guy with a coffee cup and a Bible is not necessarily going to get people to want to come in and show up. I hate to tell you, but that's the truth. All right, so come on out tonight, 6 o'clock. We, we, we start to gather, 6.30, we start the lesson. It normally lasts two hours, so 8.30, we're trying to be out the door. I, and I've been really good at stopping. The only reason why it's been people staying is because people have been yap, yap, yap after I said amen. So that's not my fault. If you're there till 9, 9.30, that's your fault, not mine. All right. Next one. Now for the big stuff. Saturday, July 17th, immediately after men's Bible study, church cleanup, building and grounds. We want to go through, get things cleaned up. We have painting projects that we want to work on, all those things. And I say that we're going to do the painting on those days, but we want to get things prepared and ready on those days. So that's Saturday, July 17th, immediately after men's Bible study, building and grounds cleanup. Along with the buildings and grounds cleanup, one of my projects that I would like to get done is I want <coughs> to get the coffee bar area downstairs set up. So we could start, so even if it's just starting with 25 cent cups of regular coffee just out of the coffee pot. And so we can at least start with something so the student ministries can start building up money. There could be money being built up. And so, and then I'm just going to be transparent here, okay? This may offend some of you. So I can stop spending all my money buying all the coffee here. Because normally all the coffee pods, the coffee grounds, all those things, except when, when you know, Alice and them, they donated a whole, we had a bunch of Tim Hortons that we went through. So praise God for that. Michael used to bring us coffee. So right now, outside of the ladies donating some stuff on Wednesdays, is normally everything falls on. It, I, I normally buy it all myself. So, yeah. This way, now I use it as a donation, so don't, don't get me wrong. But this way you can start self-sustaining and we can start buying better stuff and more stuff instead of just coffee. We start buying the syrups, the creamers, the, all those things that we want. So. And it'll give us that added dimension. We've already had somebody say, hey, we, we need to have iced coffee. Yeah, of course we need to have iced coffee. Duh. <laughs> you know? So that's part of that Saturday the 17th cleanup. Uh, it may not be having the bar completely set up, but part of that coffee bar thing that we have that was donated, the, the buffet thing, needs to be kind of cleaned up and uh, maybe painted and everything. Uh, wow. Somebody just... I wonder, did I do that? My phone is what kind of off. Oh, my ring glass. Ben, it was Ben messing with my phone. Ben was, he was hacking me. <laughs> ben was hacking on my phone. So we might just work on getting that thing cleaned up and nice and ready to go. But come on out that day. That's the grounds, the building, preparation. We want to paint. We got some painting projects outside. We got painting that we want to do inside. Again, we may not do it that day, but getting everything ready to go. Next slide, please. And immediately following that on Sunday is an all church meeting. This it is not a business meeting. This is for everybody who is connected with this church, whether you are a member or not a member. Okay? It will be immediately following the morning service before we do our 33 on Sunday. We do not have a Sunday evening service that day because it's church night at the fair. <coughs> so this meeting will have a light lunch provided, but we'll talk about updates about what we're doing here in the transition from Badger Baptist Church to Northland Assembly, how that affects everybody. We'll be handing out the form that has the, where you can fill out your, your name, address, information, birth dates, all those things. So all that stuff, everybody in one place, we can do it at one time. And then all I gotta do is on Monday come in and type it all into the computer. Nice and pretty. So it'll also be a Q&A time. How's this gonna change things? What's the difference? We do have some new policies that the board has discussed. That'll be going into place when it comes to reimbursement for items, uh, donation receipts, all those things. So we can keep a better track of everything that we are doing and a better track of how things are going. And an update on how our giving 
and our online giving program will be making some changes. So all of that will be on that day. So Sunday, July 18th, immediately following the morning service, if you are watching online and you're in the area and you want to say, hey, I want to be a part of that, come here, come out here. We're, like I said, this is gonna be a little light lunch, nothing fancy, probably just finger food stuff. And then just a time of Q&A and updates. And then talking about membership. Everybody who is a member of Badger Baptist Church uh, has the opportunity which we'll talk about this day, of transferring membership in a lateral move into an Assemblies of God model. It's no difference. All it is is just, yeah, I want to continue, or no, I don't. And as of today, we've had one, one couple say no. So and there was an older couple. We knew they were, they were probably going to, Curtis and Claudia. We knew they were getting ready to leave anyway because of their age. They couldn't support the church that much anymore. So we understood that. But we want to give everybody the opportunity to say, yeah, I want to continue under this new model, or I don't. That's only fair, right? So, and then those who aren't members who want to join in, this will be the time that we just do it all at one time instead of, okay, piecemeal. One person one week, another person another week, another person another week. We can just do it all in one fell swoop. So, if you cannot attend and you would like the information, contact me personally, and we will get together and make a time where we can sit down and talk and go over everything. So, uh, I think that's the last one, right? Yeah, look at I'm pretty good at this. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting better. So with that, we are going to get ready to go to our worship time, uh, our praise and worship. So as we get ready, as always, we practice open worship. So feel free to worship how you, fe you feel uh, as a reflection of your adoration of God. Uh, this is not a time where we're inviting God in. God's here, and we're just showing him how much we enjoy his presence. So, uh, Levine, if I can hit you, have you hit the lights and say front. I would greatly appreciate that. And I will turn this microphone off. I see Michael back there smiling. I love this. Isn't it so nice to see Michael's smiling face? It, it, it just, it, it makes church better when Michael's here. So with that, Christian, stand, sit, run, jump, whatever it takes.
Sometimes, sometimes it takes you moving, and God will run right to you. So if you're in that if you're in that spot, as we get ready to move into worship, if you need something, if you need a touch from the Holy Spirit, if you need something from God, if you just need release, you can come up. You can either stand and worship, or you can kneel. The altar is open, and even if you're still there when the song ends, it's okay. You stay there as long as you need to. So with that, Christian, go ahead and hit it to the to the worship song. Let's worship.
thank you, Lord. We just thank you for who you are. We just shout our praises to you. So we can no longer contain it, Lord, but we just shout to you. But we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you've taken our ashes and given us beauty, that you've taken our sorrow and you're giving us joy. Lord, we thank you that, that you are and always will be a God who heals, who delivers, and who sets us free. Lord, today we turn this service directly over to you, Lord. We just give you the center stage. Lord, and today that we pray that in all that we do, is just a shout to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Levine, if you can hit those front lights for me, please, sir. Uh, just a little quick FYI for those who may not understand, those who were watching online who thought it was kind of odd, uh, that someone came up. We believe in what's called the priesthood of the believer. So it is not the man on the stage who went to school who has the anointing to, to pray for and lay hands on it is the believer it, it is it is a gift that is given to every believer the bible says if there be any sick among you let them call upon the elders of the church and then say let them call upon the pastor not that the pastor can't so we we try to foster an environment here where brothers can pray for brothers sisters can pray for sisters that that as a family we know that if i need prayer there's somebody in this room who can pray for me if, so you don't have to always try to look for one person. So that's what you saw. You saw the fellowship and the priesthood of the believers in full swing there. So praise God for that. Go ahead and do the next slide, Christian, please. Be sure to follow us and join us on our website. We're updating it right now. We're still doing adding more stuff, taking some of the old stuff off, putting a new stuff on there, making changes to it. Uh, www.northlineassembly.simplesite.com Also on that site, uh, we still have our online giving platform up on there. So if you'd like to give online, you can go to that website. You can give security online, whether a one-time gift or a recurring gift. You can also place your offering in the little box on the back by the Zoom station or the large box outside or the ever so popular, as we get ready to pass the plate around, there are envelopes. If you want to designate your offering to a certain department, a certain group, or a certain item, uh, you can do that. But there that is. We'll let that pass around. Christian, go ahead and the next slide. Be sure to find us on Facebook. You can watch us live online uh, every week on Facebook. Uh, also, before we go into the next, actually go into the lesson, I want to uh, share a couple of more updates with you. We are in the process of probably by the end of this week, uh, middle, I would say middle of July, uh, once I get the equipment in, we are installing in this new uh, boom microphone system in the back back there, and we will be launching a one hour live uh, internet based radio program uh, once a week. Uh, you would have to have the app downloaded or go to that site online to hear it. It's Kingdom Purpose Radio. Uh, we'll be doing a one-hour live broadcast, and we're praying that that one-hour live weekly broadcast will lead into a 30-minute weekly uh, recorded television program. We have a station already set up downstairs to do video editing, to get our videos into the 28.5-minute uh, 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 compression that it needs to be, but we'll be moving into that. All these things are just ways to expand and expand and expand and engage every aspect so we have our hands-on engagement with our community we have our engage outreaches with uh Roseau county jail minneapolis inner city that's the region and the radio and soon to be television is engaging globally Sixty thousand radio listens last month alone and their television six hundred thousand so uh, be in prayer for that. If you'd like to give towards that, you can. That just goes into multimedia. It covers that. Uh, praise God, we have a person who stepped up and is pretty much their offering is covering the entire cost of doing it. Uh, both the, 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 the broadcast time, not the editing and all the other stuff, but the actual covering all the broadcast time for radio and television. So praise God for that. Again, what could happen in a small little country church? That doesn't think it's just a small little country church. We don't believe it. <laughs> Big things. Big things can't happen. 
Okay, so what's my next slide? Is it just the North American Assembly slide? No, it's my title slide? Okay. So you don't go ahead and hit the title slide. Let's go ahead and just jump into this. It has been a kind of an odd couple of weeks, hasn't it? A couple of Sundays because it seems like, okay, where did I find out? Oh, there they are. Uh, like last week, this, yes, it was, you know, get to the buffet and all that. But I heard from a lot of people on their feedback that the message, even though it was shorter than normal, they were like, it was just like a, a perp, it, was, it said what it needed to say. Matter of fact, we got feedback yesterday at Men's Bible Study. Uh, one person about how, oh my gosh, it was hard. It, you know, it was, even though it was short, it, had, it was powerful. And they had, him and his wife talked about it all week. Evaluating their life. What have they done? Where, where, where have they made, do they make some of these changes that we talked about last week? Well, this week is going to be no different. So, uh, it is kind of, when I look at it on the computer, it doesn't look as bad as it does sometimes on the screen. But uh, critical love theory is what I, I'm entitling this message. Critical love theory. And yes, I am titling it that way because the big thing going on in America right now, uh, it just actually almost split the Southern Baptist Convention up two weeks ago or last week at their annual meetings. Uh, they voted in a moderate progressive new president who supports critical race theory. So that's why I chose this title, Critical Love Theory, because there's something beyond that we have to think about. And as I prayed about it, I preached two different messages on two different themes, and God just kind of took those two messages and went, and so things that I thought were two different things, God showed me know that's all part and parcel to the one. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to go to a familiar passage in Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to start. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 25. On that top shelf down there, Christian, is some loose yellow paper. I know what you're going for, dude. <laughs> I didn't have my usual vehicle I drive. All right, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start at verse 25. <clears throat> it's a familiar passage. I, I know everybody, all you Bible scholars know it. You've heard it. Uh, but we're going to go through it again. And we're going to pick some stuff out of here and some other verses. And we're going to put those in the blender and show how maybe we've only been doing it halfway, thinking we've been doing it all the way. Here we go. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I think it's interesting that they made sure that, that Luke made sure that we knew that it was a lawyer. This wasn't an uneducated guy. It was the guy who had understanding and had knowledge and was educated. And he asked this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And so he said to him, as in Jesus, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So you're a lawyer. What's your interpretation? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Pretty simple, right? Jesus tells him, you read, hey, what, what do you think the law says, young lawyer? And the lawyer reads him back the, the, the statute, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, hey, good job. You've answered rightly. Do it, and you will live. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. These are the basics that we should already know. These two laws, these two commandments, okay, these are, the, the, they call, a lot of times they're called the great commandment. Mm -hmm. Because these two encapsulate not just the ten of the ten commandments, but the entire entirety of the thousands and thousands of Jewish laws that are out there are encapsulated in these two things. If you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to covet other people's things. You're not going to uh, murder people. You're not going to 
uh, have other images before him. You know, you're not going to take his name in vain because you love him, right? Because you love God and you love your neighbor like you love yourself. Now, here's the problem. Let's make sure we put this out there. A lot of reasons why we have hate instead of the critical love theory, we have critical hate theory, is because we can't love our neighbor as we love ourselves because we don't love ourselves. So it comes out as our hate towards somebody else. Because my life is this, and I hate my life, and I hate this, my hate projects onto other people. So Jesus is telling us here, okay, look, if you love your neighbor as yourself, and you love God with all your heart and everything, you're covered. You're good. You know what he didn't say? Let's look at what Jesus didn't say to see how important this is. He didn't say, if you don't walk past 25 feet on the Sabbath day, you'll be okay. He didn't say, if you don't mix your dairy and your meats, you'll be okay. He didn't say, if you don't wear certain blue inks, you'll be okay. All the, if, if, if women, if you be quiet in church, you'll be okay. Men, if you wear suit and ties to church, you'll be okay. None of the things that we have placed as the rules and commands did he say matter. You know what he said? He said, love me. If you love me, you're good. Now that may seem to us today simple and simplistic. But Jesus is saying this to a lawyer in a society that lived off of thousands, thou shalt not. And Jesus says, no, 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 the great command is thou shalt. Love God. You love God with everything, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you're good. I don't care if you did a ceremonial washing. I don't care if you've done these other things. Yes, those things are important. We have standards. We have rules. We have things that we live by. But eternal life isn't based on what you were to church on Sunday. It's based on do you love God and do you love your neighbor as yourself? Pretty simple, right? Basic stuff. But then the, then the lawyer, being the lawyer, probably jumped up and said, I object. <laughs> Who is my neighbor? And Jesus, as only Jesus can do, doesn't really answer him. Because he could have just given him a direct answer. Jesus and says this, a certain man, and starts to tell him the story, and the story that we all know, right? A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, why did Jesus say a certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho? Because that identified the man as a Jew, which means he is like you. You are a Jewish lawyer, and this is a Jewish man. You are similar. So, okay, this must be my neighbor because he's like me. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So by chance, the pastor of the local church that everybody goes to, this guy and the lawyer both attend, and they're both on deacon board meetings, and they do all this stuff, and they, they do everything. The pastor of their church walked by and said, no, and walked, and walked on the other side because I can't touch you. You're, you might be dead. You got blood. You're unclean. You're going to make me unclean. I can't do my job if I'm near you. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Let's talk about that one a minute. See, while the first one was your pastor, the other one is your friends in church. You know all those holy folk who go to church with you? Or go to the church down the street from you? Who are so holy they glow in the dark? <laughs> they come out and they see the Jewish man beaten on the side. You know what they do? They go up and they look. Oh, look. There's a Jewish guy beaten and left for dead. Hmm, pretty cool. And they walk away. Now, Jesus doesn't say why. We know part of it is the unclean laws. I think it's because what do most holy people like to do? They like to go gossip. They probably went right back to the local diner and said, hey, did you see that guy who was down there? He was beat up on the side of the road. I wonder how that happened to him. 
I wonder how he's doing. I wonder if somebody took care of him. That's what they did. So again, who is neighbor? <clears throat> Remember, that is the question. And Jesus has already introduced us to four different classifications of people. Thieves, the, the, just the Jewish guy, your pastor, and the holy folks who go to church. All the people that we would believe are the ones that we should be loving because, hey, I, hey, come on, we all love our church family here, right? We love our church family. I love seeing everyone here. I, I don't like coming in and seeing empty seats. I like it when everybody's here and I can see everybody. It feels like a we, you know, I, I feel like breaking into Sister Sledge. We are family, <laughs> right? But I ain't going to do it because I don't want to run the family off. But that's what it feels like. So because we're all alike, right? That's what it is. But then what does Jesus say? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three... Now, Jesus is narrowing it down just to three. The preacher, the holy folk, and the Samaritan. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer had to admit, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, of course, we know this story, right? We know the oddity is, is the, 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 the good guy in the story is the bad guy in their culture. Because the irony is, to a Jewish person, there is no good Samaritan. So Jesus went out of his way to say, no, your neighbor is the person you don't expect to be your neighbor. So actually, the, the pastor was the neighbor, the church folks were the neighbor, society pushing critical race theory, which wants to... to it, it, Take a group of people that at one time were maybe uplifted, bring them down so they can elevate somebody else. And it's, it's lifting one group up by, by diminishing another group. I come to you today and say that the, the gospel way, because we don't believe in a social justice gospel, but the gospel is social justice. The gospel way is everybody's my neighbor. There is no critical race theory. There's a critical love theory. And maybe we have got the theory wrong. Maybe the church hypothesis and scientific method of experimentation and documentation and looking and seeing how it's done all these hundreds and hundreds, 500 years since the Reformation, maybe we've got it wrong. Because we view neighbor as the one like me. The one I choose to like. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. If you overlook the Samaritan, you've overlooked your healing. If you left yourself in the hands of those who are just like you, you minimized your blessing. Because if the Samaritan had come around in Jesus' story here, and we don't, here's the thing, this is a theological argument still going on today. Is this a parable or is this a story that Jesus actually knows? And he's telling, because you remember there's the one time where Jesus talks about, well, what about those people who died when the, the silo fell over? He did mention world events that were going on in, in the region. So is this something that actually happened that Jesus says, hey, there was this man? So we don't know if it was just a made-up story that Jesus was telling or if it really happened. But the point is still the same. So then my question then comes to you. In this critical of theory, who is your neighbor? Who is the one that you would help? If, if, you got to look at this. This man who has been diminished. Yeah, we got this guy who's been injured. But you know what? The Samaritan has been injured his entire life just by being a Samaritan. He's a second class citizen in the nation of Israel. He, he, he's not allowed to worship in the temple. He has to worship elsewhere. He, he's been told over and over and over again, you are not one of us. In fact... Because of their heritage, they are considered bastards in that culture. 
They were a bastardized people, according to a traditional Jew. So he, his entire life, he was on the outside. So yeah, one was injured that one day, but here comes somebody else who's lived his entire life injured. But just wounds on the inside, not on the outside. And he was willing to step off of his horse and not just help the guy, but give of himself to the guy. So I got to ask you, who is your neighbor? And I can tell you who your neighbor is in your eyes by who you give yourself to. Who are you giving yourself to? Are you only giving yourself to the ones who make you comfortable? Or are you willing to stretch yourself and move beyond your sphere of influence, move beyond your realm, and when you see the hurt, not stop and evaluate what it means to you, but meet the need. Because see, the other two, what does it mean to me? The priest, I'm going to be unclean. I can't go do my duties. <clears throat> It was self-interest. The holy rollers, it was self-interest. The Samaritan didn't count the cost. And then he goes even beyond to say, whatever it takes. If this isn't enough, let me know. I'll cover it. I can tell who you deem your neighbor by who you give up to, by who you give yourself to, by who you're willing to give into, speak into, minister to. John 13. And we're, folks, we're still in foundation. I haven't even gotten to the meat of this one yet. <laughs> we're still in the foundation area. So all those weeks of short sermons, haha. <laughs> John 13, 34. Matter of fact, let's go back to 31. John 13, 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Well, wow, that's a lot of glory, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will <coughs> seek me, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus just upped the ante. He upped the ante to the lawyer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, I'm going to, I, you know what? Since I'm about to go to the ultimate sacrifice, I'm going to, I'm going to up the ante a little bit. I'm going to change the game. So a new commandment I want to give you. That you love one another as I have loved. Jesus was putting himself in the role of the Samaritan, if you stop and think about it. Because what is Jesus saying? He, the Samaritan stepped off of his horse, or his ride, his mule, his donkey, whatever it was, stepped off of it and got down and helped this person. Jesus stepped off his throne and stepped into our hurt. He stepped into our issues. He stepped into our troubles, our brokenness. Jesus is playing the role of the Samaritan here. You love the way I love. And in upping the ante, he's saying, I sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. So no longer is it just love your neighbor as yourself. It's love your neighbor as I love. Whether you feel like it, you do it. Whether it brings you pleasure or not, you do it. You sacrifice. You take love and then love now becomes a sacrificial love. Not a self-same love, but it becomes a sacrificial love. This is where we get lost because we love on the proportion of what we're willing to give up. 
Well, Jesus is about to go and give up all. And he's saying, can you love on that proportion? Even if it costs you everything, you love like that. Now, I'm going to kind of maybe stretch some theology here with some folks. But I've gotten arguments with people over this throughout my life. And a lot of people will tell you, well, he, this is only the 12. All the rest of us are under love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. That was, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's good for everybody else. This is only for believers. We only have to love believers in sacrificial ways. Was Jesus sacrificing for just believers? So I would, I would kind of want to say that maybe his thing that you got to love the way I love goes beyond just I will sacrifice for the people in my church group. Because if it was the other way, Jesus is identifying with the priest and the Levite. I sacrifice when it's convenient and it's in my circle, not the Samaritan. But what is he doing? He's saying, no, you have to love like I do. I got down off of my throne and I stepped into your brokenness just like the Samaritan got down off of his animal and stepped into this guy's brokenness. So for those who want to say, the only people i got to love sacrificially are my church family, to you I say, you got your theory wrong, and you need to go check your hypothesis again. Because he didn't say suggestion. He didn't say it would be a good idea. He said, a new command I give you. So you know what happens if you do the new command? If you do the new command, it covers all the commands. Because if you love sacrificially, you have to, you're by default loving God because you are loving like God. So it covers the two and the ten. But what do we have today? Again, we have days, we have a society where we are only willing to sacrifice for that which is like me. That which makes me comfortable. That which I agree with. And Jesus is saying, no. If that's your plan, your theory is wrong. Matthew chapter 13. I say we're going through the synoptics, but I don't have any mark on your side. If I had a mark passage, we would be going through the synoptics. Matthew 13, verse 44. This is where worlds are going to collide. Where I think for a lot of times we preached half the theory, and we looked at them as two separate events, and we need to start melding them together. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. When we've taught this before, when you've heard it through Ron Carpenter's honor series, through other people's teachings, my teaching, we look at this and we go right to honor that every person is this field. Every person you come in contact with has a field. Our body is from dust we came, right? We were just a big old sack of dirt walking around, but inside this sack of dirt, Buried somewhere is a treasure that God has placed there. And once we realize that, you, you want to know something? It's sometimes it's easier to love and to love deeper if you know that there's a treasure in there somewhere. When I was working at the group home in California, they would always ask me, why, why do the kids respond to you better than they do all the other supervisors? And I would always go back to this verse. I don't care about their probation record. I don't care about their, their 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 rap sheet. Yes, they have a field. But you know what? I choose to look and try to find the treasure in each one. So if I look at them like there's a treasure, what am I going to do? I'm going to treasure the whole thing. That's what the guy did, right? The kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure in a field, so he bought the whole field. He bought the dirt and all. See, the, the critical love theory is you got to buy the dirt to get you the treasure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we only want to see the treasure, and the treasure is what already looks like us. Uh, but I can't see that, you know, we don't know what kind of guy this guy was on the side of the road. What kind of treasure? But you know what that Samaritan said? That's a man who has value. Mm -hmm. 
There's value in him and he deserves to live. <coughs> there is a treasure in a field. And each one of us has a field. Every person we come in contact with. And you know what? Let me just throw this out there. How dare us judge somebody else's dirt when we're nothing but a bag of dirt walking around anyway? What kind of audacity is that? To walk around and think that we have it all together when we're nothing but a bag of dirt. Who just happens to have life breathed into us again. There's a treasure in each person we come in contact with. Now, it shows that... Let me see here. Oh, is that my thing froze up? Oh, there it is. <laughs> It shows that there's about six people watching right now. So I hope I don't turn you six people off. But can I tell you something? George Floyd, there was a treasure in there somewhere. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll go even further. Derek Chauvin, there's a treasure in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But if all you see is the bag of dirt, that's all you're going to get. Christian, hit the next slide. Because you see this? Honor is optional. Love is a command. See, we preach the honor principle, and that's good. But when we preach the honor principle, absence of the command of love, we're only getting half the equation. And I think that's where I've made the mistake. Others have made the mistake. And God, I think in his infinite, just showing me, boom. No, we got to put these together. Because honor is optional. I have the option to honor you or not. I have the, uh, the option to like you or dislike you. But love is a command. I don't have that option. Pastor, how can I do this? This is ridiculous. This was one of the conversations we had yesterday before Bible study started. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we find Paul's response in a verse that does not get quoted a lot. Oh, we quote 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, Pastor, I'm not just a bag of dirt. Yes, you are. There's just something new inside of you. But this is what this verse tells me. So we quote that. We put it on our refrigerator magnets, put it on bumper stickers, get t-shirts made, send out postcards with it for people, right? Hey, I'm a new creation. Praise God. We give them away when people get saved at the altar or whatever. Right? We do all those things. But if we go back and we look at verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then a few people died. That's not what it says. It says, if one died for all, then guess what? All died. How much is all? All. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, verse 16, are you ready? This is, this is the, the testing of our hypothesis for our critical love theory. Right here. 2 Corinthians 5.16. You mark this down. You underline it. You highlight it. You make this your refrigerator magnet. You put this on your bumper sticker. You put it on a t-shirt, a bag, a postcard, whatever it has to do. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. <clears throat> we regard no one according 
to the bag of dirt, but to the fact that there is a treasure in there. Now let me demonstrate something for you. Let me demonstrate something for you. Uh, <laughs> Levine and Roger, can you come up here real quick? Let's stand right here. So if one died for all, all died, right? So Jesus gave grace in his death to all. All got it. Now... Roger, now see, look at Roger. <laughs> Roger's saying, I'm keeping this, this gift. Now, Levine may be sitting there going, I don't know what to do with it. I, I don't know if I want it. It's, it's just a buck. What does it mean to me? It's, you know. One died for all, all died. Here's the thing that, okay, again, it's going to stretch some people's theology. When Jesus died, he died for everybody, and everybody died. His grace was sufficient for all. The people with the good bags of dirt, that's pretty, and manicured, and got roses coming out of it. And the people who theirs might have some stuff that smells in it. They all got it. What they choose to do with it isn't a thing. So our command is that we no longer regard anybody according to this outward, this flesh, this bag of dirt. My job, and Paul's telling us in Corinthians here to the Corinthian church, is to regard everybody as they have received grace. What they have done with it is their business. But grace is there for them. So I have to regard them as people and recipients of God's grace. Whether I choose to embrace His grace, whether I choose to live in His grace, whether I choose to invest in His grace or whatever, that then becomes irrelevant. That's between you and God. My job is i got to love you the same way I love Him. And i got to love Him the same way I love you i got to look at both of you the exact same way. That's critical love. That's critical love. When we can say, you know what? I can honor. So yeah, I can go, you know what? This guy, he's got the, the pretty flowers and stuff. So I, it's easy to honor. Right? But, uh, I'm just... <laughs> you guys go ahead and sit down. Look well, yeah, they gave their grace back. <laughs> so anybody who believes in eternal security, they just proved it wrong. <laughs> just joking. But you see how that works? This is what Paul's telling us here. This is what critical love looks like. When we recognize, again, that Jesus died for everybody and everybody has received the grace, whether they want to live in it is different. Now, you get some people you say that to, oh, you're a universalist. You just think everybody's going to go to heaven. No. The one who doesn't want it isn't going. But the gift is there for them. They have grace just like everybody else. Whether they choose to operate in it is a whole other story. Which next slide, please, Christian? Honor gives you access. Love reveals the treasure. So when we just honor people, it gives us access. Remember that in the in Ron Carpenter's thing on honor? Whatever you honor comes towards you. Whatever you disrespect and dishonor is moved away from you. So honor gives us access, but love reveals the treasure. Because can I tell you something? We can honor something but never get the access to something. A lot of you in this room, I pray all of you, have shown me honor. Now, yesterday I was running around in my Pastor Ninja shirt that I got for Pastor Appreciation, right? <laughs> honor. It was finally warming up. You know, I, mean, I got a new pair of, this, this new pair of shorts I like. I said, I'm going to throw this shirt on with it. It would be perfect. Right? That was honor to get that for Pastor Appreciation. So, so I would say, a lot of folks in this room honor me. But you know what? There's only one person, and she's not in this room, who has access to my bank account. <laughs> so all of you should, can give me honor so you have access. You can all walk into border, but can none of you get into my bank account. 
But Tracy, the one who loves, has complete access. You see the difference? So yeah, we have to honor to get in the door. As I was praying about this this morning, I'm sitting there thinking, the imagery I got was, honor is what gives us the map. Love shows us where the X is. So yeah, there's a treasure in a field. Honor gets us onto the field, but love shows us where the treasure is. Can you imagine what would happen in our society if people lived by this concept? Where it wasn't just honor, but it was honor coupled with love? Working in unison to receive access and treasure? To know that in each individual, the, the, the Latin is the Imago Dei, right? The image of God exists. Whether on the outside they show it or not. This is the life that we have been not just called to live, commanded to live. You see the difference? And if he has commanded us to do it, then here's the thing, because I know a lot of you, I don't know because those people or that person or this other guy or these, these, these people groups or whatever, I don't like these people and I don't like those people and I don't like this group and I don't like that group. That's all fine. And I, Pastor, I could, I could never love those type of people. But if he commanded us to do it and he's a just God, you know what he's done? He's given us the power to do it. So you're saying you can't is a cop-out. You saying your can't is part and parcel to I refuse. Because if he's commanded us to do it, he's given us the power to do it as well. This is what we've been talking about on those Wednesday nights and last Sunday, or the two Sundays ago at the Rosal Diner, right? When we walk in the, the power of the Holy Spirit, right? We are spirit of power. When we walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, he gives us the power to live out the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. The Holy Spirit is what gives me the capacity to access the treasure. So when I live outside of the Holy Spirit, I might be able to honor you, but I can never truly, truly love you. We are at a critical juncture in society today. And so I'm thinking about right this radio program. One hour, I'm like, man, an hour, an hour live on the radio. Uh, you know. Then Lord said, you know what? You've been writing articles since 2015 for the newspaper. You could just go back through those articles. You could have all of those and all be radio programs, right? Oh man, yeah, praise God for that. But I'm thinking, but how do I introduce rural church to this big, huge, you know, audience that uh, is predominantly African-American. The, the group who started this. So a lot of ministries on there are African-American ministries. How do I introduce us into that equation? And I was thinking about Scott Hagan and what he said at the Unite service and what we've studied here, and, I, and I've been studying since uh, I came up here that we know that in 1906, the Azusa Street Revival broke out in Los Angeles and created the Pentecostal Revolution in the United States and globally. But now we know, in lesser known history, that in 1895, there was a Pentecostal Revival that broke out in the Northland here. That stretched from Fergus Falls all the way up to Lancaster. And pocket communities all through here were affected by that Pentecostal kind of outpouring. There was divine healing. People were being healed miraculously. There was evidence of speaking in tongues. The entire Pentecostal nutshell in 1895. But why, why do we point to Azusa and not 
northern Minnesota. You know what the Holy Spirit told me this morning? In the Old Testament, people got glimpses of the coming Messiah through prophecy. But the Bible says, and at just the right time, Jesus came. People had seen visions of it. People had given prophetic words about it. Isaiah writes all about it, right? Daniel writes about it. We see these messianic prophecies all throughout the Old Testament. And you know what? But they weren't ready. Because the area wasn't prepared to receive the Messiah. Those who've taken synoptic gospels, it talks about that, right? Mm -hmm. The preparation. But once the area was prepared, right, there was Pax Romana. There was a common language. There was the Pax Romana being Roman peace. You could move throughout the empire freely. All these things that allow Christianity to spread like wildfire across the globe were all in place. So at just the right time, Jesus came. But still, before he came, people had visions and prophecies of him coming. Azusa Street was just the right time. But if Azusa Street was just the right time for the Holy Spirit to fall and shape the nations, why did we see it here? And why wasn't it sustained here? Could it be that here was just the prophetic beginning to show the world what could be? And the reason why it wasn't sustained here is because it couldn't be? That sounds like an oddity, huh? I'm going to show the world what it can be, but I'm going to show it to you in a place where it can't be. Because it went to Azusa Street where it was a black man in a woman's house with white people, black people, Asian people, and Hispanic people all in one building, united. What were they doing? They were regarding no one according to their dirt sack. But they were all in one place in one accord, waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall. This is a region, and I'm going to say this, and I'm not, I don't mean any offense to anybody. This is a region that does a very good job of judging people by their dirt sack. So maybe 1895 was the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to give you a taste of what could be. And then in 1906, I'm going to show you how it's supposed to be. So maybe in 2021, we could come out and live it the way it's supposed to be. Critical of theory. Yeah, honor is great. We show respect to people, right? Even if they might be different than us. That's good. That gives us access. But the command was never to honor. The command was to love. Love brings us to the treasure. So my call today, my charge to this congregation, here in the building, here watching online, those who are going to watch later on on YouTube, those who I may be speaking to on a radio program. The call is, can you love beyond the dirt? Because Jesus had to love beyond your dirt. Pastor, it's hard. It's hard. Pastor, you don't know these people. I, I've told this story before. The first year we gave the gifts to Roseau County Jail. A person who's a secretary or an administrator in a large church in Roseau saw me at the guest house and said, Oh, that was so nice what you did. But we couldn't do that because those type of people are in that jail. You know what some of those are in there for? Yeah, they have a bad dirt sack. But there's a treasure in there somewhere. See, honor gave us access, but love fills the bag that we give to them. Because that's not just honoring. Because I can honor you say, hey, you're next con. Hey, praise God. God loves you. But when we take that extra step and say, you know, we're going to sacrifice of our resources. We're going to get down off our horse. We're going to put our money in a bag and take it and make sure you get it on Christmas morning. That's moving beyond honor to love. Yeah. Do we have people in this room who are full of, of 
who, who have been treasures that we've, we've mined from that operation? No, but you know what? We probably have people in this room who have been blessed because we've done that. Because they've given into that. And the blessing has seeped into their life. The treasure doesn't necessarily... Get, let me, let me, oh, man. This one, this one, the Holy Spirit just dropped into me right now, Ben. The treasure you receive doesn't necessarily have to come from them. Just knowing that they have a treasure gives you access to treasure. You know, I come from, from California, right? I'm a 49ers fan. The 49ers fan is 1849, the, the California Gold Rush. So I could go to Mariposa, and if I know that guy has a mine over there that's got gold, and if I dig in the same area, in the same region, I could strike a treasure, but I never got it from this guy. So just because I gave in to this, so that inmate at Roseville County Jail may never come in and sit in our pews and never do anything. But it has given us access to a treasure beyond. I wonder if this is why Paul makes us known that he that we have a, or the, the, the Bible makes it known to us that we serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the gold and the silver therein. Because who regulates the treasure? The owner of the treasure. And who is the ultimate owner? So, I may show Ben honor, and I may, I may step down on my horse and love him when I see him hurting, and he may never, ever walk into church here. But the owner of the field, the owner of the overall, the master of the treasure, will give me access whether Ben ever releases his treasure here or not. Because you know what? Maybe our job was only to reveal maybe to Ben because maybe Ben, all he knows is he's got a field. He may not even know he has a treasure. But our getting in there is what shows him, Ben, you do have a treasure. And because of that, you know what happens? What happens is because somebody told that to Ben a while back at a men's Bible study, then on today, that was what, 2017, 2018, Ben? So in 2021, that same person who walked in as a field, who now knows he has a treasure, doesn't have a problem getting up and laying hands and praying for somebody who needs healing. This, this is what critical love theory is about. It's not about us being blessed. It's not about us getting access. It's about accessing the kingdom of God and all that he has. And watching God bless all those around us. And if our part is only, the only job we have in this, the only stake, the only dog in this fight, is we have to look beyond the field. Not just honor, but love. Sacrificially the way God loves. I mean, I like you, but you know what? I'll pay for your lunch today. So, we got that TV, that TV, the TV in the entryway, the TV <coughs> downstairs, most of all the coffee products, all the clear cups, all those things, all the plates, those black uh, vinyl chairs downstairs, all the silverware, all those things. You know where they all came from? They came from a man named Keith Pringle, a homosexual. Does he have a bag of dirt? Yes, he does. Do people know that he has a bag of dirt? Yes, he does. And yes, they do. But when we can look beyond the bag of dirt and think that, you know what? If one died, then all died. Once we start deciding to pick and choose who gets God's grace, then we have taken God's sovereignty away from him and we have given it to us. Then what happens is we live in two world theories. We have the God that we create in our image and the God who created us in his image. And we choose to worship the God that we create. Who says, I get to love who I want to love. Because I want to love those who are in my image. 
But when I serve a God who created me in his image, then I have to realize that if I'm created in his image and he's not a respecter of persons, then every person is created in his image. Whether they live it out or not, that's different. But honor gave us access. It gave us access to benefits that we didn't have before. These TVs, all that stuff downstairs, pretty much underwrote the first two Thanksgiving meals we had over at the fellowship hall. Things that most people don't know. But so we can honor, well, you know what? Honor, because sometimes we can honor people, but then use them for what they have. But you know what happens when you love? I'm just going to go out. I know he doesn't like this. He didn't want to be made public, and I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm just going to do it. But you know what love does? When you can take somebody that you may not want to be around, that may be different than you, that may be something that the Bible says is wrong, but when you show them and you access that and you go deeper than just honor, then when he's in Seattle right now getting chemotherapy, they think he may die, who's the first person he calls and says, will you pray for me? Because I'm scared. It's not just honor. It's can you love? Because you know what? Keith Pringle was the guy who went from, from Roseau to, to Oregon, and somewhere along the way, cancer stepped down and beat him up and left him on the side of the road. And sadly, most church people have more time talking trash about him because of business problems, personal problems, and his lifestyle choice than saying, you know what? Let me pray for you. What would happen? What would happen if that was the attitude we took? I don't care. I want to love you. I know you got dirt. I know you got problems. I know there's a lot of stinky stuff in that dirt. But I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to love. I'm going to count you as friend, not foe. You know, just because somebody is an enemy of the cross doesn't mean they have to be yours. Because our job isn't to love them to the cross. But when we take and we make our own worldviews and we say, no, I want God to be my God. I want to create him in my image. That's why we have pictures of a blonde-haired white Jesus, even though he was a Middle Easterner in a country with no sunscreen, probably deep leather skin. But no, we, if I get created in my image, I can love that Jesus. But you know what's the sad part? To white America, including myself, is it was a Middle Eastern Jesus who loved me. Why can't I love a Middle Eastern Jesus? But no, i got to make him look like me. Because if he looks like me, then I'm comfortable. Because I can only love in comfort, not in sacrifice. And the command is love as I have loved. And I'm about to give everything up. I'm going to close with this. That even Jesus, 100% God, and a hundred cent man struggled with it because what? When he was about to love, ultimately, what did he say? Thank God that there's any other way. Can't I just find some other plan? Because I really don't want to love like this. Because you know why? Because sacrificial love, folks, let me just tell it to you. I'm just going to give it to you straight. Sacrificial love hurts. Yep. And Jesus in the garden knew that. He knew just because I'm 100% God, I'm going to have to feel every whip. I'll feel every thorn. I'll feel every pulse of a nail. And God, if there's any other way, because love like this hurts. So I just want to warn you right now. Don't come back and yell at me and say, Pastor, I got hurt because I love. Guess what? That's part of the equation. Because one died for all. All have died, but not all are living. Because today, guess what? He's still feeling the hurt. 
Each time someone rejects the message, he still feels the hurt. Why do you think they rejoice so great in heaven when somebody comes to salvation? You can only re the, the, let me tell you something. The 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 amount of your praise to me is equivalent to the amount of your hurt. The greater the hurt, the greater the praise, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you think they just heaven goes all crazy when one person gets saved? Because heaven knows the sacrifice it took for that one person to get saved. So you will hurt. You will be disappointed. You will feel pain. But praise God that earlier the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church, I had this same struggle, guys, and I had a thorn in my flesh and it hurt. But you know what God told me? My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Go out there and be hurt. I'll take care of you. Even when it hurts, I'll take care of you. Church, we could do this. We could do this on a scale like no other. If each one of us went out of here today with a determination to say, I'm going to love like he loved. I'm going to purposely and intentionally engage in love with someone different than me. And you know what? Roseau County is right for it. Because there's a whole group of them at the Roseau Motel right now of people who are different than people from this area. Well, I wonder what would happen if one of you guys wandered into the diner one day and saw one of them up there ordering their food and said, you know what? I got you today. Man, you don't know me. It's all right. I just wanted to bless you. When you engage in love like that, what could happen? What could happen? I can tell you what could happen. We could change the world. Better yet, though, we could be a piece of what Jesus had already started. We could continue to be world changers, like he did, like the Apostle Paul did. Like in Hebrews 11, when he gives you that chapter of faith. We could write our name on that ledger. Let's be those people. Let's not be the people of hate. Let's not be the church that wants to make God in their image, but wants to worship the God of the Bible. And say, he said it, I'm going to do it. I think of the hard things that we've overcome here. Different ministry outreaches and stuff that we've done. Thanksgiving. And other churches have tried to do Thanksgiving. And then that one, you know, well, I'm, I was at Silver Dragon. And I heard people from that church say, well, you know, when we have that type of meal, those type of people show up. <laughs> Praise God. That's why we have that type of meal, because I want those type of people to show up, because somebody needs to tell them there's a treasure in their field. Amen. Somebody needs to love unconditionally. There was a man who went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell upon thieves. And he was left wounded in the ditch. And the pastor came up to walk by and said, I'm sorry, I'm off the clock. I've heard it. I've been told I work too hard by other pastors. That after hours, we send them to the sheriff's department if we get any late night calls. Sorry, I'm off the clock. I can't help you. And then another group of people, his so-called friends from church, walked by and said, I can't help you. I need to get to the diner so I can talk about you. And did you hear what happened to Joe? I can't believe it. Joe went up for prayer today. I wonder what's wrong with Joe. I wonder what he is. But then there was somebody who decided, I want to be like Jesus. And I want to step down from my place of pleasure and comfort and step into his hurt. This is Romani in James chapter 1. James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the Jerusalem Council. 
James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. It is to step off your horse and to step into somebody's life and help them. That's what Christianity is. That's what pure and undefiled religion is. To step off of our horse and to step in. Why do you think he used widows and orphans? He covered both ends of the spectrum. From the oldest to the youngest, you step in <coughs> to their hurt and you don't. And you don't allow the prejudices and the biases of the world to mar you. Let's go practice pure and undefiled religion. Not the religion that we've been taught. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now for what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for your ultimate guide and sacrifice. That you gave yourself up. That you stepped down out of heaven and you stepped into our brokenness. You saw us hurting and beaten and bruised on the side of the road. And even though you knew the pain that it would cause you, you stepped down and stepped in. Lord, today I pray that we would be a people who step down and step in. That we will be a people who will look beyond the dirt bags, beyond the sacks of flesh that we see around us and the outward appearance, but that we will no longer regard anyone according to what we see on the outside, but know that on the inside there is the Omega Dei, the, the image of you in there. They may not know the Lord, but let us be agents that can pull that out of people. No matter the cost to us. Lord, today I just pray that each person under the sound of my voice who may not recognize that they have a treasure, that maybe one day, yeah, they think they do, but then they don't. They may, maybe, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, that they've been operating off of fool's gold. That they thought what they were doing was valuable. They thought that what they were living was right. Or today I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would reach into their hearts, convict them and show them there is a better way. There is a real treasure and you have real access. If you're out there and you say, Pastor, I don't have it. I don't got it. I don't, there's no treasure in my life. I want to tell you, yes, there is. And the Holy Spirit is here right now to show it to you. Just let them. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for what you're doing in our midst. I thank you and I praise you that your Holy Spirit is empowering us and making us a spirit-empowered people who will go forth and not just sing your praises, but demonstrate your love. No matter the cost. Lord, as we go today, let us be people of pure and undefiled religion. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Take that one. <laughs> Meditate on that one. Join us back again tonight at 6 o'clock at the Roseau Diner, 6.30. We start the discussion. We'll probably be discussing a little bit of this, a little bit of the Holy Spirit, uh, putting it all together, but it's a great time of discussion. Uh, come out and join us. We would love to have you. And with that, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he establish you. And may he forever give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.